we can leave the, the participants in if you like. They're coming in now. A warm welcome to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, to the uh, next edition of the JATS Expert Talks. And uh, today we have a, a, an excellent lineup, and uh, I will explain uh, to you later who we are going to feature and what uh, the content will be and how, what we will be discussing. But before we start, I would like to welcome you also on behalf of the team. Uh, today, that is Laura Niemeyer, Ellen Belvin Sanchez, Esma Morgul and Ingrid Garcia. So if anything goes wrong, these are the names to blame. But I'm sure that uh, they will do fine uh, backstage because we have been doing this um, already quite a number of times. So also this evening, it will run smoothly. I'm sure about that. So um, as we are already um, doing this type of activity online for almost a year, I'm sure that you are familiar with the next slide, which shows the rules of, uh, of uh, engagement. Um, if you can put it up, Elvin, then we can have a look at it. Thank you, Alan. So um, um, uh, we would like to ask you um, during the plenary presentations to uh, mute your microphones, to switch off your cameras so that you have your privacy at home and you can do and say whatever you like. Um, if there is anything uh, you may want to discuss, um, we can do that again online using the chat. Um, you can also raise a hand if that, uh, if that is needed, if you would like to engage in the discussion. And uh, as you have been made aware of, this is a, a, a webinar that is being recorded. So I hope that you um, have a consent uh, with this and that that is not a problem so that others who will not be able to be with us at this very point in time can uh, jump in later so ladies and gentlemen let's have a look at the subject of today so what we will be discussing with you is the issue of uh, the use of data science and artificial intelligence in healthcare in the broader sense and we have two eminent speakers, that is Maurits Kaptein and uh, Esther de Vries, who I will be introducing later in more detail. But they will be presenting the keynote uh, speeches today, and they also will provide um, ample, um, uh, let's say, elements for discussion um, on which we can then engage in the panel session. But maybe to warm you up a little, um, a few slides that I simply collected to give some point of view on this topic of data science and artificial intelligence in healthcare. So this is, let's say, the idea that, uh, that many physicians have that uh, they can remotely um, carry out all the work that is needed to be done to run a hospital smoothly and to treat patients in the best way that is possible. And this is not simply a dream, but as the next slide already shows, um, there is um, in the domain of uh, the Netherlands. Um, could you move it ahead, uh, please, Alan? Yes, uh, this is a, uh, uh, a message that is uh, more than a year already old. And it was uh, the announcement, the first announcement in the Netherlands that two Dutch hospitals now formally have approved of using algorithms to advise in medical diagnosis. So that means that uh, from this perspective, there is this convergence between, let's say, the um, inspection of images and that in the process of making the appropriate diagnosis, the data um, 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 uh, elements and the smart algorithms are being used and uh, in conjunction with the opinion of the physician, a diagnosis is made. And uh, this, at that point in time, was, was rather big news. But again, this was also not new in terms of the development, as we can see from the next slide. 
And uh, that is a slide that uh, we borrowed from, uh, from GAIO, that is an official organization in the United States, it's the US Governmental Accountability Office. And they already some, uh, some year uh, or one and a half ago, they make, um, let's say, uh, a segmentation of the fields in healthcare where data science and AI can be applied. So it's not only um, the element of image recognition or image processing, but it has to do with what we often call um, the care cycle. Uh, it has to do with monitoring uh, patients. It has to do with uh, predicting uh, trajectories, but also with the uh, with, with processing the surgical uh, actions and activities itself. And then, of course, that is in the blue part. It is all about, uh, let's say, making the hospital running smoothly and bringing it to a next level of operational excellence. And in the next slide, uh, Ellen. Please, um, there we see it. Uh, this is already four years old, but it still holds true, even the numbers that go with this. Here you see um, what the uh, expected um, savings in cost um, will be in the year uh, 2024, because that is the forecast, more or, less, or 2026. That is the forecast. And what you see that indeed in the domain of uh, the robot assisted surgery, that is the biggest field uh, of application where we expect, or at least the specialists from Harvard Business uh, School expect the largest savings. And then you see um, down to the bottom um, where the cybersecurity is also something that uh, is important, but you see a number of very, very interesting fields where savings uh, are being made, uh, are expected to be made from this domain of using uh, technologies like data science and artificial intelligence. And um, um, as, a, as a final slide, I would like to mention that this, these developments um, in the healthcare domain, and then we move gradually also to the content of the presentations today, is something that uh, the hospitals are working on um, very thoroughly, but also over a very broad range of activities. And I simply picked out this, uh, this slide, it's from MIT. And they have these online courses where they um, educate the entire, let's say, professional uh, population of hospitals in this domain of artificial intelligence. And what I particularly like about this slide is you see six modules and each of the module treats the elements that they teach during the course and uh, the nice thing, and that's also the reason why we show it to you, is that there is, of course, on the one hand, um, a module that's module one on what does machine learning mean and what is AI and how are we going to uh, develop uh, certain kinds of activities on this broad interdisciplinary field. And then at the end, it's talking about the integrated approach in the hospitals on optimization of all processes that are meaningful. And uh, I can also disclose at this very point in time that also within JETS, we have this type of courses and that we are currently working on the development of these courses in a, a very broad setting, also in conjunction with the Dutch AI coalition to make it accessible to a very large audience because there is a lot of education to be done in this very nice domain. And having said that, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to announce the keynote speakers of today, who will both from different perspective address the issues that we just more or less touched upon. And um, well, the first speaker is Maurits Kaptein. And uh, it's always very nice to, uh, to announce Maurits because we have been working together and that is of, of no professional significance for a very long time, but I like to mention it because Maurits is one of these very talented young people who have developed in this domain in a very special way, and that's dear to me. Um, he calls himself a scientist and entrepreneur. He uh, has an appointment with Jazz and with Tilburg University. He is a professor of statistical methods, machine learning, data science, and uh, has a, a specific application domain in the um, field of personalization, 
I'm sure he will touch upon that. He uh, holds a PhD with honors from Eindhoven University of Technology. And he has also a broad international experience. He uh, worked in Denmark at Aalto School of Economics, at Philips Research, and also at Stanford University. He's, despite his young age already, the author of three books and more than 60 publications. So it gives me great pleasure, Maurits, to hand over to you. And I hope that you will uh, share with us your insights in this very interesting topic. Please take it away. And I was muted. I'm unmuted now. So now I guess you, you guys can all hear me. So thank you, Emil, for the uh, quite uh, introduction. And, and thank you all for, uh, for being here tonight. Um, I'm gonna, gonna try and, and do a somewhat, I don't know, maybe ambitious talk. So I'm gonna cover on a, on a bunch of uh, very broad topics, maybe also controversial, because I'm gonna try out some, some, some views on this problem that maybe are an unpopular opinion, but hopefully that sparks some of the discussion at the end. So, so let's see where we can go. Um, I have about 20 minutes, uh, but feel free to, to go and, and like interact in the chat. I think the chat is moderated, uh, but if there's any, any core questions that are coming along, I'll try to answer them. Um, so um, Emil actually already introduced myself or introduced me. So I guess this slide just goes to show that also for myself during the lockdown, the uh, uh, barber shops were closed. I guess that's all we used to take away from this, uh, this slide right now. Um, I'll just dig in immediately to actually what I aim to talk about today. Um, so what I'm gonna try and talk about today is a project that one of my PhD students works on or still working on, um, which actually is trying to build a machine learning model for the personalized treatment of chemotherapy or, or of colon cancer. So the personalized decision whether or not to administer adjuvant chemotherapy for colon cancer patients. But in some ways that project is just gonna be the backdrop of the story. So, that, so that's kind of the practical, kind of the, the practical uh, application of the, this story. But I'm gonna talk a bit more about slightly more abstract things. So I'm gonna briefly introduce our aims in that project of, of kind of trying to learn this machine learning model that makes choices on who to treat and who not to treat. Um, but that really is just a, a backdrop for trying to explain how these types of models work. So, so how are these things actually, actually trained? Like what does it mean to create such a model to make these individual decisions on treatment or no treatment? How, how does that kind of proceed? Um, then I'm gonna try to talk a bit about one of the, uh, what I would say core challenges of making these types of models, which I'm, I'm gonna discuss under the heading of what I'm calling causality. Um, and I think this is actually a very serious topic that is in some ways often overlooked when people are trying to make these machine learning models. So I'm gonna devote some attention to it and at least try to explain what the problem is and how we could potentially remedy that problem. I'm definitely not gonna solve it, that problem because I don't think it's a solved problem at all, but there are some approaches to it and I'm, I'm gonna at least highlight uh, what the problem is exactly. And finally, I'm gonna talk about something that's another hot topic next to causality, um, but that's called explainable AI or interpretable AI. Um, and here in red, my comment, whether it's serious or not so serious, this is actually gonna be much more of a, of a slippy slope for myself or thin ice, uh, because this is not my main subject of research, but I've been interacting with a lot of people that are working on this topic. And here is where I'm really trying to kind of pitch some of the ideas that I have, and maybe also spark some of the discussion with the field. So, so this is really kind of some preliminary ideas, but I'm happy to just have a discussion on this topic really. Um, so that's, that's my plan for today. Um, and again, maybe that's ambitious, but we'll see how far we can get. Um, so there we go. Next slide, sorry, fiddling around a bit with the technology here. Um, but I'm gonna start with this, with this model effectively that, that I was talking about. So um, let's first start with actually what is the backdrop of this problem? Oop, we clicked through two slides, there we go. What's the backdrop of this problem? The, the practical, kind of case that we're, we're considering here, but I think this, this talk goes more broadly. The practical case that we're considering here is the fact that we have uh, true EKNL, uh, which is the Dutch, which actually maintains the Dutch cancer registry. 
through them, with their help, we actually have access to effectively almost 50,000 rows, so 50,000 data points of individual colon cancer patients, and whether or not they received chemotherapy after kind of the, 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 treat, the tumor being surgically removed. So that's quite a lot of people. Um, and there's actually quite some variation as to whether or not people receive this chemotherapy. Um, and there's a lot of like debate in the field as to whether or not this should happen. Um, this data set next to kind of the background characteristics of these patients, for example, their age, their gender, their tumor type, and the treatment decision also actually contains whether or not these people are still alive uh, two years and five years after the treatment. Um, so what we're trying to do in this project is effectively trying to learn whether or not when you administer chemotherapy, people have a higher probability of surviving for another five years. So, so that's kind of the backdrop uh, and the data that's there. And note, this data is just data as it's being collected in the hospital. So this is not a trial or something, but this is really patients that are going into the hospital that have these disease where effectively the doctors are making this treatment decision. So the doctors right now, whomever's treating the patients is making this decision between chemotherapy, yes or no. Um, so that's kind of the backdrop of this, of this project. Um, and then effectively where we are now, I would say is maybe rightly summarized with this image. So we're now at a point that we can do the following. If a patient comes in with specific characteristics, so age, gender, tumor type, there's, there's way more in the description of the actual patient. Um, we uh, effectively have a computer that does some cranking on that data, and then we'll put out whether or not this patient should be administered chemotherapy. So that's typically what we would call a black box model, basically. We don't necessarily, well, somewhat, we, we, do what, we do somewhat know what's happening, but in some ways, you can abstract this away. It's just a computer, you put in these numbers, and what comes back is whether or not people should receive chemotherapy if the aim is to live for another five years, basically. Um, and this is the setup that I wanna discuss in this talk. So I wanna talk about how that black box was actually built, what are some of the challenges to making such a black box, especially in the fields of what I'm calling causality and explainability or interpretable AI. So I hope that backdrop of this talk is kind of clear. So I'm gonna start first with trying to explain how one makes such a black box. And I'm not gonna to try to explain this for this specific project. I'm actually gonna much broader try to give you a view on how computers learn these types of things. So how does such a black box computer actually work? So based on data, how do we create a model that for a new patient is able to output this decision? Um, and really, sorry, I'm always like, I'm trying to click through my next slide and then it's, so there's a bit of lag in my slide which is hindering my, my talk. So I'm trying to open up this black box and let's first kind of see what the aim is. So just the way in which this is done. Um, and really the aim is that we're trying to create an algorithm, so that's the box, um, which effectively allows you to generate a, a prediction of the expected survival rate. So, so kind of the probability that somebody will survive for another five years, given both treatment and non-treatment. So we can actually fill in all the details of the patients and then say, oh, what's, what is our expectation under treatment? And what is our expectation under non-treatment? And then from there on, the logic is simple. We just pick whatever has the highest output. So the basic idea is that we're trying to make, and I'm, I'm actually kind of visualizing this here, we're trying to make some model F that's just some mathematical model, some function, some mapping of the treatment characteristics of, of the patient and the treatment to the outcome. And if we have a model like this, we can just pick the outcome that leads to the highest kind of health outcome, basically. I hope that's somewhat clear. Um, so I'm gonna try and explain how these types of models are made quite broadly. So how do we do this? We have a bunch of data and now we wanna to try to make, again, we wanna to try to make a mapping from the patient characteristics and the treatment, yes or no, to this outcome measure. How do we actually do this? Well, the way we do this is as follows, and this is gonna scare away some people. So please bear with me. We'll, we'll skip over this and I'll explain it in, in detail. But basically 
very abstractly, what we're looking at is the following situation. We have some data, which normally kind of in machine learning, we talk about as consisting of feature vectors. You should think about those as being the characteristics of the patient. So this first line is the characteristics of the patient and maybe the treatment, yes or no. And then we have the outcomes, which is whether or not these people have survived for another five years. So that's my data. And now I'm gonna assume that I have a set of potential mappings from the patient to the outcome. So here's one very simple rule. A very simple rule would be that everybody who receives chemotherapy survives for another five years. And everybody who does not receive chemotherapy does not survive for another five years. So that's one specific rule. Once I have one specific rule, I can compute whether that rule is correct. So I can look in my data set, whether or not it's indeed true that everybody that did not receive chemotherapy has not survived for another five years. If you would do this in this data set, you would find that that rule is definitely not correct for everyone. So what you could do if you have a class of rules, so if you have a, a large set of more of these types of rules, you could say, oh, let's try another rule and see if that other rule works. So if I have a large set of possible rules and some way of evaluating whether my rules work, effectively I can try to search for the best rule in the set that I have. Okay, so that's a bit abstract. So I'm gonna give you one very practical example that's hopefully somewhat simple to parse because if you parse this, you actually know how most, at least conceptually, of machine learning and AI, and at least what we call supervised learning actually works. So here's a very simple example where we're talking about eight different cities. So this is my data. Uh, I have their latitude, so how close they are to the North Pole, their altitude, how close they are to the sun. I don't know if this, that's the best term, uh, but at least how high they are and whether or not it snows there in winter. So that's a simple data set. So that's my data, input, altitude, latitude, output, snow. Now I have a class of models. So I'm, I'm looking for these different types of rules and suppose we're just considering simple three rules. So three rules would be things like this. If the latitude is smaller than 50, and if the altitude is smaller than 1500, it either snows, yes or no. So this is a type of rule. These kind of trees are types of rules. And let's just consider that our error function is whether or not we were correct. Now I can go through the abstract kind of example I just gave for two very specific examples. So one of the things I could do is say, well, Let's say we're just considering this rule. So this is a tree. This is a specific tree out of all the possible trees that I could build. This is a specific one. I'm just saying, as long as the latitude is smaller than 50, it won't snow, otherwise it will. I can check for each of the cities whether I'm correct or not. And I see that I have some error because I'm wrong for two of these things. Okay, fine, I'll try another rule. So let's add altitude into the game. And now say every city that has an altitude that's smaller than 1500 meters, it won't snow, but otherwise it will in winter. And actually on this specific data set, you would see that that specific set of rules effectively has zero error. So this is perfect. Now there's all kinds of de de details as to whether or not this is a great way of going about, but at least conceptually, it's trying to explain that I can try out different rule sets and see how well they work. And as long as I can do that, I can learn a mapping from input to output. Um, in general, that leads to an algorithm that looks something like this. And I'm not actually gonna talk too much about this algorithm. Some of you would have technical backgrounds and can read actually what's happening here. Um, but I just wanna stress before I'm moving into some of the other bits of the talk, that this simple idea that I've just explained. So as long as I can generate these rules flexibly, I can create a new rule and see if it's okay. That that allows me to learn extremely complex relationships between input and output. So I think many of you have been, for example, quite impressed um, by seeing a computer that's able to, on a picture, recognize all the people that are in the picture. That's learned through the exact same mechanism as what I've just been talking about. The input is the image, the location of the people is the output. And as long as I have a lot of examples of images and where the people are, and a very flexible set of rules. So now you really have to, in some ways, extend your mind to not just trees, but these, these rule sets are tremendously large. They're really, really large. They're mappings from each individual color of a pixel to where this person is. So they're really, really complex rules. But it's still a very simple process. As long as I have a powerful computer, 
I can generate a rule. I can see if it is correct on the data that I have. If it's reasonably correct, I can try a new set of rules. If that's better, I'm going to adapt the better one. I'm just going to continue until I have some set of rules that is effective. And this is exactly what we do in this setting as well. So we have the data of these patients. We have their five-year survival rate. And we're just going to have a computer try out how the patient characteristics map to their five-year survival rate. Yeah. So, so in, in, in some sense, it's a process where we don't necessarily know these rules, but we do know how they're generated. We know the logic of how to do this. As long as we can generate these rules and evaluate them, we have a process of creating the black box. We don't necessarily know what's in it, but we know how we made it. So that was the first bit of this talk, is how the, are these black box models actually created? So now you have some idea. You have no clue what's in the black box yet, but you just know the process as to getting to something that's in that black box. Well, there's a lot of challenges to this view. And some challenges um, I want to discuss with you in the next effectively 10 minutes. Um, and there's two that I think are predominantly important, or at least are in some ways hot topics, especially when machine learning is used in healthcare. So when these kind of black boxes are being created in healthcare. And one of the problems or, or hot topics of debate is what I'm calling causality. And let me first briefly actually introduce what I mean by causality. So what I mean by causality is this simple idea that we can wonder whether changing something in the input really causes a change in the output. So if, if I have this black box and I make some change to whatever I put in there and I see that the output changes, is that in real life going to happen? Like, is that same change going to lead to that same change in output in real life? And one very easy, I think, to follow example of this problem is the fact that if you look at data right now uh, for breast cancer treatments and you look at um, breast cancer patients who receive chemotherapy, you would find, and this is also what a black box, if, if done poorly, would pick up, that everyone who receives chemotherapy has a lower survival rate basically, for breast cancer. However, if you think about that example a bit more, you can think about whether or not the chemotherapy decreases survival rates. So whether the action really causes the survival rate or, and which is actually the case in, in much of this data, whether the severity of the tumor. So if you have a big severe tumor, that will cause it to not be possible to surgically remove it which will cause you to both receive chemotherapy and have a poorer life expectancy than those who have a smaller tumor. So this is what I mean by causality, is whether or not we can actually be certain that if we make changes to the input of our black box, that the predicted outcomes are actually those that are gonna materialize in the real world. So you can see why this is a very important problem in healthcare. If we have this black box and it tries to learn something about how do I make a change, like, if I make a change to this input, here is how the survival rates change. Well, is that really going to materialize in practice? Because is there really this cause effect pair in play? Um, one of the things that's interesting here is to think about the fundamental problem that's happening here. And the fundamental problem is relatively easy to explain. And it's as follows. Um, for every person, so here I have this table of people. So in our case, for the colon cancer, it would be 50,000 people approximately where some of them received the treatment and some of them received control. So some of them re re received chemotherapy, others did not. And for each of these people, I see some outcome. You know? However, in reality, there, I would say, you can think about this as follows, where you could think about every person having a possible or what's called potential outcome when they receive the treatment and a potential outcome when they do not receive the treatment. So each person, if I either give you chemotherapy or not, you will have a different outcome. Both of them in some ways exist, or at least we can think about both of them existing, but I only see one of them because you're receiving chemotherapy, yes or no. So I'm only receiving effectively half of the data. And the fundamental problem when you're trying to learn what would have happened if I had done something else, is that you're actually trying to learn these gray numbers, which you just haven't observed. Um, 
This is what's called the fundamental problem of causal inference. And I really believe that this is one of the most challenging problems right now to the use of machine learning and this kind of black box learning that I've just talked about. And it's used in healthcare is us having some clue as to whether or not what we're learning is really a causal effect. Um, there's a few solutions to this and it's actually an exploding area of research with lots of super interesting work basically. But if I would just want to summarize that work and here maybe some people would disagree so I'm happy to discuss this. My summary of most of that work is that in short, we can never really be certain that what we're learning in these black boxes is actually the causal effect. However, a slightly longer and slightly more realistic answer is that through various methods, we can try to become more certain. One of them is very simple, at least in, in theory, is what if we just manipulate ourselves? Like if we are the people that are trying chemotherapy for some, trying not trying chemotherapy for others, clearly like if we're making these decisions and we know that these decisions are not confounded by other things, we should learn something about the effect of the treatment. So that's one, and, and it's effectively what we do when we do large scale experiments, which is obviously not the type of data that we collect from the hospitals, because that's just not where an experiment is being ran. The, the other alternative is effectively to use what I'm just calling on this slide here, a bunch of different ways of statistically controlling for confounding. And that those methods are really evolving in the last decade. And I think by now we have fairly good methods that if we use a combination of both. So if we both use some experimental data and statistical control, we can be fairly confident about causality. And this is exactly what we're doing in this project because we're not just using the 50,000 um, rows of data from the hospital, but we're actually also using data from a large scale randomized controlled trial. And we're using a lot of these techniques to control for confounding and seeing also if these things match up. So do we get the same result from our black box as we get from the experiment. So I think it's an important kind of theoretical concept to consider. Um, now this other health topic. So this was a bit of my view about causality and I think it's one of the most fundamental problems that we're facing right now in using these kind of black box learning methods in healthcare. Um, another kind of hot topic, maybe fundamental problem, we can talk about that a bit, is whether or not we should be able to understand or explain exactly what's happening in that black box. So should we be able to kind of look under the hood of this black box and see what's going on? Um, and I find this a very challenging topic for various reasons. One reason being that I would say, well, if we want explainable AI or machine learning, then I hope you just got your answer. I just explained to you how this black box was actually made. Clearly that, that's not an explanation that people are often looking for because it doesn't really help to say what's in the black box, but I told you how it was built. So in some ways I've explained how this machine learning actually worked. I, I told you how to replicate it. If you have the same data, you could go through the same process and build it again effectively. Um, but that's, that doesn't suffice for most people. So, so let's, let's kind of explore this a bit more. Um, and again, this is where I go into like thin ice. So, so I would say, what do we actually mean by kind of trying to interpret or explain these kind of black box models? So I think what we mean is that given that we're relatively certain that this model works, so that all the statistical kind of guards have been put in place, that the data was of high quality. So, so all of these kind of basically lower bounds are met we often still feel that we, we need to have some kind of explanation such that, for example, a doctor can explain to a patient why a decision was made or the, the patient themselves can kind of understand why they received chemotherapy or why they did not receive chemotherapy or at least why in some ways this was recommended to them by the black box. So in some ways we get to a point that the data scientist maybe, the doctor or the patient um, are looking to understand that model. And I think it's interesting to kind of think about why we would want to understand that model. And I think the reasons in some ways are, are various. So, so it's, it's a much less defined problem than this causality problem. Um, because the first reason is because we want to check and validate some of these decisions. We want to know if the black box is correct, effectively. Um, 
but we also maybe just want to convince ourselves. Maybe we're, we're quite okay that it's correct, but we want to build confidence in, in these decisions and confidence in this more general process of using these machine learning algorithms. Um, maybe we just want to challenge some of these decisions. If we were unhappy with whatever was recommended to us or to our, to our patient in this case, um, maybe we want to identify the cases where this doesn't work or maybe and then it becomes much more procedural maybe we just want to mitigate liabilities that are there now i'm always done because i see some of you looking worried that i only have two more minutes or something and i will finish in two more minutes so so emil you know cheer up we'll, we'll we'll get there um i think these these kind of reasons are various there are a few interesting ideas of how to cover this explainability right now and i'm just gonna talk to through two of them very briefly so one is this idea that what I could do with this black box is effectively rank which of the input variables are most important. And so if I make a change, for example, to age, is that going to have a large effect on the outcome? Or if I make a change to the, the BMI, is that going to make a large effect on the outcome? This is one way in which people are trying to interpret these models. Um, I think it's actually a very poor strategy. And it's a poor strategy because of the uh, subject I was just talking about before, because of the subject that changing BMI, even if that's a large change in output, does not guarantee that that's a causal effect. So we might be explaining things to people that are incorrect. We might be explaining that BMI is important, but actually that's not the cause of the outcome that we're seeing. So I think there, we should be really careful. Another approach that people have been perceiving, pursuing is this idea of what I'd call local exploration. So if you have a specific patient, you can look around the region, so to say, for that specific patient. So if you have a specific patient who is female and 30 years old, you can say, what if, what if she was 31? Or what if she was 29? How does this change? Um, that seems interesting for deciding about an individual case. However, I would say the most kind of likely use for this is in cases where in some ways a doctor or whomever is using this model is uncertain, they'll be uncertain in kind of special cases. Now you're kind of making small changes to a special case. Those small changes might produce a different output, but maybe the things you've been changing aren't important at all in the larger scheme of this model. So maybe now you're creating a model, a mental model for yourself of this model, that's totally incorrect by just looking at these local points. So I think these two things actually don't satisfy. And I would go as far, and that's where we might go in the discussion, that I don't think we actually need to explain this black box. Because what I think we do want is confidence in our decisions. And I think we can build confidence through ways that are not explaining the model, but are actually controlling the process of building these models. I also think next to confidence, we would like to have, so a patient and a doctor would like to have what I call a good mental model. So some understanding of how this process works, but that might not be correct. So, so one example here is that most of us know how to drive a car. Hardly any of us really know how the engine works, basically. All we need is a good mental model of where the brakes are and where the gas is. And I think the same is gonna hold true for machine learning in healthcare in the future. We, we don't look for explaining this black box. We look for a process that guarantees the black box to be like, you know, at least meet a lower bound of, of quality standards. And we look for good mental models that help us to make decisions, which is very different from actually understanding exactly what's going on in the model. Um, so there we go. I'm sorry for stealing a few more minutes, but I think we're, we're, we're not, too, do, not doing too poorly on time yet. So there we go. That's a, uh, that was my contribution for today. Thank you so much. Oh, there's lots of stuff happening in the chat as well. So yeah, see. there is uh, indeed. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Maurits. There is indeed uh, a lot going on in the chat. Um, but, but given time, I saw an interesting question from Daniel and also from Hinrich, uh, Daniel Capitan and Hinrich Goldman. Um, I would like to suggest that we postpone them until the end. Then we have uh, ample time because it's uh, good to move on, I would suggest, to the second presentation. So bear with us, uh, Maurits. We will yep. have a debate later on. And um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the second speaker of this evening is uh, Professor Esther de Vries. Um, Esther is educated as a medical doctor from the University of Utrecht. 
with a specialization in child care. Um, she's a professor currently at the Tilburg School of Social and Behavioral Sciences, um, department of the Tilburg University. And uh, in the uh, area of what we call Transo over there, and that stands for Transformaties in the Zorg. And then that is specifically in the field of care and welfare. Um, Esther holds uh, additional appointments. So she's also um, uh, an advisor at the Elizabeth State Twee Steden Ziekenhuis in Tilburg. And uh, she is appointed as a researcher there. And she also holds a position at the Jeroen Bos Ziekenhuis in, uh, in so the uh, hospital in Den Bos. And there she is a data science coordinator, which brings her work very close to our field of interest, of course. Her specialism at, at present is chronical diseases and the, the let's say, entire management of the, of the care chain. And uh, it gives us great pleasure to give her the floor on, uh, on, on a number of subjects, but uh, especially the, in the domain of uh, using the data for improving care in the broadest sense. So Esther, I can see that you are with us, which is great. Um, could you take it from here, please? Yes, and thank you, Emil, for your kind words. And I will uh, start giving my presentation. So let's see whether this works. Yes, it works. So the title of my talk is Using Our Data for Improving Care. And with our data, I mean the data we collect in healthcare on patients uh, most of the time. So Emil already told you that I'm uh, and that professor at Tilburg University. I have been a pediatrician and immunologist for a long time at the Jeroen Bosch Hospital, but uh, I'm not practicing anymore. And I've grown more and more towards doing only research and more and more in the field of data science, although I'm not a data scientist myself. I, I'm more like the linking pin between uh, medical doctors and the data scientists. And that's exactly my function in uh, the Jeroen Bosch Hospital. So in this hospital, uh, now this year and last year, we of course had a lot of changes because of the coronavirus situation, but already before that, we found that the world is changing and that old fashioned uh, hospital strategy wasn't really working anymore. So we worked on a new hospital strategy and we were very ambitious and said, well, in 2025, the people from Sertogenbos and surroundings will give their health-related well-being the highest rating in the Netherlands. Well, that's really ambitious, but anyway, the most important part, I think, is that what we say here is not that we are the best, but that we look at what the people think they, they, they feel like, what their health-related well-being is. So we take the perspective of the patients. And that means that we look to uh, make patients decide for themselves, to get the care that shoots them, so that fits their way of thinking, their way of living. And we want to work together in a network. The hospital is no longer the one and only place where you can get real good care, but it's part of a large network of primary care and care by, for instance, even relatives. Now, of course, uh, we're now talking about the research we're doing there and not about the patient care itself. So, uh, but we kind of put the research themes we are working on now, build that on the hospital strategy. So network care is a very logical one, uh, patient-centered outcome research as well, but we also chose data science and that has several reasons. And the most uh, important reason is in fact, that this is a very hot topic and that we are everywhere in healthcare uh, going over to uh, collect all our information on patients uh, electronically. So we also can do something with all those data and we don't do that yet, at least not enough. So that's why we started this theme. And for this theme is, uh, that's my uh, responsibility to develop that. And uh, we also developed a kind of uh, strategy for uh, data and information in the hospital in general. And this is what we said, we, we have to connect with our research team to the information landscape of the hospital as a whole. And 
we should be careful not to see the data science as a goal for our research. That's more something that people like Maurits should do in, uh, in the university, but we must see data science as a means to improve the care for our patients. So we'll use it and we will make optimal use of the knowledge and value present in the routine hospital patient data available in the electronic health record. All hospitals by now have electronic health records. We also have had it for several years now. And these data are lying there waiting for us to be analyzed. And we don't do that enough right now. So that's what we wanted to, uh, to do and what we set out to uh, do. And we formulated three themes in our data science uh, research uh, line. And the first theme was simply learning from our daily work. Not that we didn't learn from our daily work before that, but that was also mostly on the basis of one patient or small groups of patients. But now we have the possibility to do a retrospective data analysis on large groups of patients and also on large uh, amounts of data. And then the next theme is tailoring the care to the patient. So giving the patient the care that, that shoots them. And for this, we want to develop prediction modeling. And I will come back to some details about how we are going to do this. And then the next theme is in fact that it's very nice to do all these kinds of things, but then when you have developed that, what are you going to do with it? So we want to learn to display that knowledge, to be able to explain it to the people who have to start using it and to actually start using it. So here you can talk about explainable AI, something Maurits already talked about, but also about fair data. When you collect such a lot of data and do things with it and you have secondary data, Maybe other people can use them as well, but that gives you a lot of problems because this is about uh, very special data. This is uh, medical data about patients. So you have the GDPR that you have to uh, comply to. And we have to work on open access. So uh, what we find should be available for as many patients as possible, not only just in our own hospital. I don't see these, ah, there they are. But what's in a name? So we have the theme data science, but we also hear about uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning. And actually when we started developing uh, ourselves in this field, we find that there are a lot of different uh, definitions for these, uh, these terms, for data science, for artificial intelligence, for machine learning. And I'm not going into details, but I would just want to show you that there are very many different things you can find about that but actually when we look at it in the hospital we say well when we talk about data science we talk actually about the data that we have in the electronic health record and we and we talk about prediction modeling we're thinking about machine learning and maybe in the future we go into deep learning but artificial intelligence is something that's more or less developed in another department in our hospital which is called the innovation th uh, team and this is more about uh, wearables, about uh, e-health, about uh, long distance uh, monitoring of patients, uh, things like that. So in our hospital, these two fields are more or less uh, split apart. And I think that's a pity and we should do something about that. And in that innovation uh, team, we, uh, we have people working on artificial intelligence also together with people from the Tilburg University uh, and as this, is, this is especially focused on image recognition. But we uh, in the research department uh, are more focusing on developing knowledge and the innovation team is more focusing on implementing it. And I'll come back to that later, but we have an interesting example in the innovation team. One of them is in the radiology department where for instance, we have been uh, starting to use bone expert, which actually wasn't developed by us, but this is a way of finding out what the uh, skeletal age of a child is. When you are growing as a child, your uh, bones are slowly developing. And this is especially a very detailed uh, analysis possible in the bones in your hand. And this can tell something about the height you can achieve uh, as an adult. And this can be important information. And this is something that I've been doing as a pediatrician long ago with an atlas. 
and a lot of uh, pictures in it. And then I started counting the bones and looking at the different forms. And now we have uh, very nice algorithms that are doing the work for us. But there are a lot of other uh, ideas and the most uh, important problem we met actually when, when these ideas come up is that we don't know how to, uh, to evaluate them, whether they are useful for us and how to implement them. And for this, we have uh, developed an uh, artificial intelligence roadmap and I'll come back to that a little bit uh, later on in my talk. But now I'll go back to my own field, which is the, uh, the data analysis. So what about retrospective data analysis? Many people don't realize that when you go to a hospital as a patient, that all the time, lots and lots of data are being collected. Uh, not only uh, what the doctor writes down uh, in just plain text, but also laboratory results, uh, the, the, the visits you made to the hospital, the time of the day that you came there, did you come at night? Did you come acutely or was it on an appointment? And all these data could give uh, some information about the situation uh, that you are in. So we think that using all those data can help us to better understand situations uh, regarding our patients. And I will give you one example about uh, that. And this is about uh, a project we are doing right now, which we call SID, and this stands for secondary immune deficiency. Uh, secondary means that it comes from outside. It's not a disease that you have yourself. And it is because you get a, a drug from the doctor because of a certain disease, for instance, rheumatoid arthritis or Crohn's disease or multiple sclerosis, or it is also possible for oncology. So when you have a tumor, you can get a medication that influences your immune system and gives you uh, immunosuppression. So your immune system doesn't work as well anymore. And then you don't have your immune system just for nothing. Your immune system is also very important to stop infections. So these new uh, drugs are very useful to treat, for instance, rheumatoid arthritis, but some patients get uh, severe infections when they use them. The problem is we don't know who those patients are when we start the, uh, the drugs. So what we're trying to do now using the data that we have on these patients, and in fact, it's a bit uh, the same kind of uh, approach that Maurits discussed about the ECANL and the oncology data. We have a lot of data. We know the outcome because we also know whether those patients had severe infections, severe enough to be admitted to hospital for them. And so we can collect uh, those data and look into them. And this is a, an example of a set of data from one year in the hospital of all patients who uh, had rheumatoid arthritis and who used uh, non, uh, no uh, drugs that, uh, that influenced the immune system, one or several. And when the dot is very small, the patient in question, every dot is a patient, the patient in question does not use, did not use any immunosuppressive drugs that year. And if the dot gets bigger, it's more. You can see here that up to seven different types. And then here we see on the x-axis the number of pneumonias, um, so severe pulmonary infection, that the patient developed during that year. And normally you shouldn't have any pneumonias. You can be unlucky and maybe have one in a lifetime. But the, here are several patients who had several. So this is zero, one pneumonia, two in one year, three or even four. And here you can see something that's very important. Because most of those patients who get these drugs did not get any pneumonia at all during that year. And it's only a few who did and some even quite a lot. And what we actually want to develop is a uh, a, predict, a prediction model that can tell us the chance that you're one of these patients instead of these. And that's what we're working on now. And why is that important? It's important because for these patients, maybe you would want to choose another drug or you would want to do more checkups or uh, give them some uh, preventive measures to uh, stop their uh, pneumonia from developing. So this could be very important. So this will make us understand better what we have to do for which patient. 
And then another example, we could also just get more knowledge out of uh, our data. And I'll show you it turned a bit smaller than I think I put it in the slide when it was transferred to the Windows uh, format, but well. Anyway, what I'm showing here in this uh, graph is that the population is a large group of people and some people visit the general practitioner, the house arts, for simple common colds, a cough. And it's not much special, but some people have a lot of it and they go to secondary care and in the end might even end up in tertiary care, so in a university hospital and might be found to have a rare disease. And the problem is when you have a rare disease that a general practitioner normally doesn't think about that because they usually don't see it. So we're doing also a, a prediction uh, modeling uh, project to see whether we can find ways to find these rare patients because of the pattern they show. Now, I put a graph here and we shouldn't go into the details, but anyone can see that this graph has a very different pattern from this one. Whereas the X and Y axis contain the same uh, thing, the same variables, but the population where the data come from is different. So this is a group of people with a very severe form of a rare disease. And this is a group of people with who is having these problems, but do not have that very severe form. So you can see here in a simple uh, graph that there could be a difference in pattern in these patients that could help you recognize them. And that's what we're also trying to, uh, to uh, develop based on our routine healthcare data. And with this, we have shown that uh, we can in fact find those patients in our uh, hospital uh, community. And that even when the, the the, the problems in their uh, laboratory results seem not as severe as some other patients could have, that it can still be a serious condition. So this can also lead to publications and then to uh, changes in uh, the way you uh, look at these patients when they visit you in the outpatient department. But we find that we walk into a lot of barriers uh, when we try to do this retrospective data analysis because data quality is not always good. There's a lot of unstructured data. We also have other problems like people don't always trust uh, what comes out of these pr uh, predictive models, something that Maurits was talking about too. We have the GDPR to comply to, so we have to be very careful that we do not use data that we should not use. And of course, it takes time and it costs money. And for facilitators, we need to change a lot in the hospital. So we have to build trust, we get to change the culture and we have to align with the strategy. And of course, we have to get the infrastructure and investments and we are working on that uh, right now. So a small example is uh, that how we try to solve that is when we work together with uh, a new company, well, uh, not extremely new, but still more or less in the startup phase, who is uh, developing software that helps to search the routine data in the electronic health uh, record, but in a completely GDPR proof way. So the output is already given to us in a completely pseudonymized way. And this is just to show you the kind of interface we have to work with that because it's also built in a way that uh, researchers in the hospital who do not know what happens behind this screen in the algorithms can still work uh, on uh, developing their queries for their models. So this is a very interesting development and a clear uh, example of how you can work together with, uh, with developing um, enterprises in the field. Then for prediction modeling, that is a very uh, interesting yeah there it comes interesting field because we want to personalize medicine so we want to develop care that shoots the patient and uh, we have seen a lot in evidence-based medicine development of uh, working with randomized controlled trials which sounds very logical you take a group of patients you split them in half and you let uh, uh, randomly decide whether they get treatment a or treatment b 
And then in the end, you uh, collect all the results and you can tell whether treatment A has a better result than treatment B. This sounds very logical and it's not wrong, but in general, people are being uh, selected for these kinds of uh, trials who do not have other diseases, who are not too old, not too young, not pregnant women, for instance, not children. And that means that the people you see in the consulting room generally are not the same people that take part in uh, randomized controlled trials. So you want to go to prediction modeling on, based on routine healthcare data to be able to uh, develop your uh, treatments more personalized. And one example that we're working on now is developing uh, a prediction model to be able to predict the chance that elderly people are frail and frailty or kwetsbaarheid as we call it in the Netherlands in Dutch is that people who get older might be more vulnerable than you can see immediately see on the outside but that means that if you treat them as if they are healthy adults uh, that you would maybe even harm them so you have to find that out and that's not always so easy when you're not uh, trained in that field. And we have been working on uh, using routine healthcare data to try to predict whether someone is frail or not. And we use actually uh, methods like Maurits described uh, in his uh, talk just now, but I will only show you a small uh, result. What you see here is that what actually is the case with the patient. So this is the group one, who is actually frail. So in the end, we have a label from a medical specialist who tells me whether the patient is frail or not. And here we have all the people who are not. And here we have the prediction. So the prediction, whether you were frail or not frail. And here you can see that this is just a cutoff level that you can choose. When you, for instance, choose this cutoff level, you have here a large group of people where we predicted that they were not frail and this was true. So that's good. But here we have a group of people where we predicted that they're not frail, but in fact they are. So that's not good. So those are the false negatives. And here we have a whole group of people where we predicted they're frail and they are. So that's good. That's the true cases. But here we have the false, uh, sorry, the, this is I say it the wrong way. This is the false positives and this is the false negatives. And by moving this cutoff level up or down, you can change the, the situation where you put, uh, which you call uh, positive or negative in your prediction. And this is a problem that we, uh, that is very difficult to solve because right now we do not have anything to check whether someone, uh, this is not what I want. Hmm. We do not have uh, a screening like this. So right now, actually what we say is, well, we just guess that no one is frail. So we miss everyone. And we could also change that and say, well, we're going to check everyone who is 70 years or older, but then we had, would have this whole lake of people who are not frail, or we would have to do all kinds of extra things. So we need the, the, the doctors to be able together to, um, to decide whether uh, we, where we want to put that cutoff level, because it's in the end, the doctors who will have to decide we were, what we are going to do with this uh, prediction model. So for this, I will not uh, spend too much time on this anymore, but it's important to be able to make good visualizations, to tell stories about what you're doing and that's what we are developing as well now. And this is just a few examples. I'm not going to go into detail about what's in here. It's just uh, to show that. I want to say a few words about this AI roadmap because it's a very nice example of working together, in this case with MNI partners, where we uh, won uh, a competition. They, they did that uh, because of the, the celebration they had. Whoa, what's happening here? And uh, they developed together with us an AI roadmap for uh, an organization like our hospital, where we can find uh, questions that you have to answer to, uh, to know how you should tackle 
developing uh, artificial intelligence for use in your hospital, either uh, the algorithm or how you implement it. And of course, in these 20 minutes, I do not have time to show all that, but you can see here the uh, URL that shows you where uh, this uh, AI roadmap can be found and you can take a look at it. And it's actually really a very nice, uh, a very nice uh, checklist for uh, where you can find the readiness for your organization's readiness for artificial intelligence and also an implementation checklist uh, for AI in your organization. And you can do that for any specific piece of AI that you want to implement. Now I can tell a lot more and 20 minutes is actually very little to, to, to tell you about what we can do in the hospital, but maybe you have some questions or otherwise we can go to the general discussion. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Esther. Um, there is a lively parallel circuit in the chat. I uh -huh. am going to try to, to uh, channel that a little. Let's, let's start and uh, stick with you, Esther, because there are a, few uh, more technical um, questions also. Mm -hmm. um, there is a remark by Erwin van Lettem mm -hmm. on the uh, use of PAX systems versus compact disk. Um, Erwin, would you like to, um, to share your insights with Esther and the audience? Uh, yes, I would definitely like to do that. I, I was just wondering. So, with Yats in 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 the Bos and 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 um, and Jeroen Bos uh, Hospital, um, whenever um, images need to be accessed from the outside, mm -hmm. um, the only way of getting access to an image, even with consent of a, of a patient, is actually a, a compact disc, which is a bit of technology of the previous century. Mm -hmm. while other hospitals actually provide this with the packs on web uh, access. So I was just wondering how that fits together with such a nice presentation around roadmap on <laughs> AI and machine learning and all this stuff. So. Yeah, uh, well, I don't know what to say to that, but <laughs> uh, I'm not a radiologist, so I, I don't, unfortunately, don't know anything about how the PAC system is, uh, is organized in our hospital. But I do know that we now have two PhD students who are working on a research uh, project uh, uh, on AI, on images, and that they have actually built a system to be able to view um, those images uh, anonymized uh, for the research. But I think maybe what you're talking about is when this is when patients have to... Uh, move to transfer uh, their images from one hospital to another that is well, for, for example when a radiologist when a radiologist would like to access the images from australia or whatever i mean in yeah. other hospitals yeah. or in most of the hospitals it's a paxon web I know. access code so it's it's and i think also in uh, medical imaging it's important to share and also to build on, yeah. on 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 knowledge so i was surprised to get that remark from indeed the uh Jeroen boss because it's perhaps a little bit off topic, but, but it's, it's, it just gives the, 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 the gap which there sometimes is between what's in people's head and roadmaps on AI, machine learning, etc. And how it happens in practice when you want to scale it and you want really to leverage the, let's say, um, uh, uh, human intelligence combined with machine intelligence uh, globally. Actually, you're, you're hitting uh, uh, the nail on the head. This is exactly not, I'm not working with the images, but, but with the data, but it's the same problem we have when we want to uh, access the data, that we have a lot of uh, uh, highbrow plans, but actually we are living in the past century uh, in our systems. And this, we're working on that. It's not only a problem in the Jeroen Bosch Hospital, it's a problem in all, all uh, general hospitals in the Netherlands, actually, and also a little bit still in the university hospitals. No, fair, fair enough, so thank you for your answer. Thank you. Yeah, good point. Thank you very much, uh, Erwin, for bringing this up, uh, because it shows uh, that things should, uh, let's say, uh, develop in parallel, and that is not so easy. Another technical question um, came from Uzai, Uzai Karimak. On the, uh, on the data collection issue in your approach. Uzai, could you pose a question to Esther, please? Okay, hi Esther, thanks for the presentation. Uh -huh. So in when doing uh, retrospective analysis, I was wondering how do you deal with the problem of this uh, hypothetical deductive data collection in medicine? 
that is data has been collected about a patient because someone thought that would be relevant for that patient. So, uh, but you know, if no one hypothesized it, the data will be missing actually. So how do you deal with that in, in, in your approaches? Uh, that, that is also a very good question. And of course, a, a, a very large, uh, a big problem because uh, all the routine healthcare data uh, are collected not uh, for this purpose that I'm using it for and, and, and others are using it for. It's collected by the doctor uh, in their deductive process to see what's the matter with the patient and when once they have started the treatment to uh, check how the treatment is working out. But uh, what we do is, um, uh, of course, we cannot completely solve that because that's, this is just what it is. Uh, and several data are simply not there, but you can also not only look at the data themselves, but also the fact that they're there or they're not there tells you something about how the doctor uh, was, was evaluating the patient, what, what they were thinking, what they were feeling about the patient. So if they do a lot of laboratory tests, for instance, you can uh, suspect that the doctor was worried about the patient. And if they don't do much and send the patient home, and don't uh, admit them to hospital, you can suspect that they, they, they were not that worried. Now, this is a very simple uh, example, but that's the way you're treating it, but you're right. So uh, you have to be very careful uh, about what, you, what you're checking and what you can find. But actually uh, the, the, the picture I showed of the frailty in the elderly, actually I had expected we wouldn't find anything. And what I've used there is just uh, laboratory values and admission uh, data. So how often was the patient admitted to hospital in the past six months? And actually we were able to get, well, not that bad a graph on that. Of course, there were still a lot of either false positive or false negatives, depending on where you put the cutoff. But we were able to make, uh, to, 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 well, to, to, to make good, uh, predictions in quite a large uh, amount of the patients. So I think it can bring you something, but I'm absolutely convinced that for this, you will also always need a human in the loop to, uh, to supplement what you do with your algorithms when you just use routine healthcare data. Thank you, Esther. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is that okay as an answer, uh, Uzai? Yes, yes, absolutely. All right. Thank you. We get back to you later on the discussion with uh, Maurit. So uh, stay with us for uh, a few more minutes. Um, we move to Henry Gulman, if I pronounce it correctly. And uh, also from his side, there is a question to Esther on the uh, unbalanced data or the use of unbalanced data. Henry, could you take the floor, please? Yeah, good evening. Thanks very much for the presentation. Very quickly, I saw when I, uh, when I saw your data, it's very obvious that your data set is very unbalanced. So yeah. how do you plan to deal with it? Do you have any other data sets from other hospitals that you could check your potential signature or your potential marker to see to what extent that holds true? Not yet, but uh, I'm working on uh, doing that uh, with a data set from the Elisabeth II State Hospital, where I'm also, uh, I'm also connected there. And we have uh, other hospitals that we're working together with in the uh, IMPROVE uh, collaboration. Uh, so yes, we're, we're going to do that. But uh, actually, because of that, we also tried, for instance, uh, what is the result when we do uh, under and oversampling, so undersampling of the majority class, oversampling of the minority mm -hmm. class, and see what happens. And actually, not doing that gave uh, more reliable results than when we tried that kind of uh, adjustments. But yes, this is this is a large uh, problem: the overfitting mm -hmm. uh, for everything that you're looking when you're but when you're looking for anomaly detection. Actually, what I did uh, is. Uh, higher uh, uh, data scientists, because as I said before, I'm not a data scientist myself. Um, hire a data scientist who started just this week with a lot of uh, experience in uh, accounting and banking uh, uh, for anomaly detection. So fraud, fraud uh, transactions, things like that, where they have the same problem. And so they're uh, much more experienced than we are in uh, dealing with this. And so we are going to work on that. So uh, we are very well aware of the problem but the solution will not be easy. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Hinrich, um, for bringing this interesting point to our attention because it always 
is, uh, is, is a, uh, uh, an important element um, in data science and the use of data for analytics. So thank you very much. Um, let's move on to Maurits then. Uh, possibly we get back to you later, uh, uh, Esther. Mm -hmm. But there is uh, a, a question that is uh, floating around already for quite some time this afternoon or this evening. And that's from uh, Daniel Capitan on the use of technique. So Daniel, are you still with us? Go ahead, please, Daniel. We can see that you are unmuted. His it's audio is broken, is in the chat. Ah. Okay, if... Um, Uh, yeah, um, do, are, are we, is, is Daniel um, muted or offline? Yeah, so he, he's okay. typing that his audio is broken. Yeah, okay, I, I can guess. see but, that. But I guess the question was was about two calculus. I think that's the question you're referring to. Huh? So, yeah, more in general terms, what techniques yeah, did what, you what, use? What kind of methods do we use? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, so, so so, so specifically what Daniel was asking, yes, we do use do calculus and some of kind of what I would say Perl's framework or at least kind of ideas where with kind of conditional independencies, we can try to uncover causal structures. Um, but admittedly, in most of these work of, of this type of work, we're using this potential outcome formalization that I also kind of somewhat highlighted in one of the slides. So kind of Rubin's causal inference framework, basically. Um, that, that feels a bit more natural here, although there's obviously like close relationship between, between the two, two approaches and, and we're trying to use both. But for this specific uh, project, we're really thinking about it in terms of these potential outcomes and whether we can effectively impute them. So, so one way of thinking about this causal inference problem is that it's a missing data problem. So I'm missing what, what would have happened if I had done something else. And this is one way of really thinking about how we're building these models. Hope that helps. All right, thank you very much. Mauro, then I think it's, it's time and also nice to move on to your provocative statements about causality and uh, the type of models that we should use to, let's say, convince ourselves of uh, the, the correctness or the rightness um, of the outcome of the analysis um, carried out by artificial intelligence techniques. And there were a lot of uh, um, remarks in the chat. I don't know um, whether or not Mauro, you have a chance to have a look at it, but I would like to go back to Hinrich because he was the first to address this issue of causality in, uh, in his remark. So Hinrich, if you could uh, unmute again, and start a discussion on this topic, please. Sure. <laughs> um, so I'll try to make it very brief. So um, I'm Hinrich Kuhlmann. I'm actually with Janssen Pharmaceutica in the pharmaceutical industry. And I've been working a lot with colleagues in the machine learning space. And in the pharmaceutical industry, you work with um, huge data sets from compound libraries that you have. and um, as you can imagine in our space, we are very much interested to find out new ways of designing molecules um, and have been working on um, machine learning approaches to, to improve that. Um, and what we've seen many times is that um, even though we would like to see causality and interpretability of our models, actually um, as long as you have a strong confidence interval around your models. Um, it oftentimes is not necessary that you are able to explain where, where the signal comes from as long as it's a very strong, robust signal. So correlations in that space um, are often completely sufficient um, to help you with the results from your model to take the next step. Um, yeah, so I, I, I maybe know too little about the exact space where, where you're in and where you're working. I, I do think like your, your general initial comment was like, oh, I don't think we always need causality, so to say. 
Um, correct. Which, which in some ways I, I would agree, yeah, but even, even if you consciously decide in some ways to not use some of that machinery, because yeah, one way of thinking about it is just, oh, there's been a lot of, like there's been a lot of new methods developed to kind of explicitly deal with potentially causal problems. Um, I would say even if you consciously choose to not use these methods, in effect, at, at the very least, you're kind of considering causality in your problem. And you're considering it up to a level that you know that for the problem that you're interested in, uh, this, this is not really hindering your external validity of what, whatever way you want to think about it. So, so I think that's progress. And I do think you're right that in some problems you would in some ways decide against using some of that machinery and, and, and fairly so basically. So, so, so there I would definitely agree. Um, there, there's one other thing though that I do think that yes, there are definitely situations where some of this machinery might not be useful and maybe, maybe people are just not after a causal problem. On the other hand, I do think often people somewhat underestimate how quickly you end up, you end up in a causal problem, basically. So, so a lot of kind of uh, prediction type models, which some people would motivate as being purely, purely prediction, whatever that means, um, in some ways do, would then maybe kind of through some longer chain of events um, lead to us changing, changing our practice. Right? So in healthcare, um, whether that would be changing when we're taking an MRI scan, not necessarily immediately changing the treatment that we're going, but just changing the whole process or making changes in that process. And in some sense, I would say that if, if you change your process based on the results of your, your modeling efforts, um, then you very quickly venture into a space where you have to think about, oh, are my results and, and hence is my data gonna be similar after I've made this change? So, so am I affecting the way I would think about these kind of problems as, am I affecting the data generating process with the change that I'm making? And if you are, um, well, then you do, like in some ways would benefit from using some of the, these methods that are explicitly being developed for causal inference. So I, so I think, um, yes, there are good situations where this might not be helpful, but sometimes there is this tendency to somewhat overstate when it's not helpful and, and it might be very implicit. So even if you learn things um, and kind of the way you were talking about it, like, oh, my confidence bounds are small enough and whatever, if then in the future you end up making changes based on that analysis, you might end up changing the data generating process where, where it would have been interesting to just think about whether that new data is gonna be affected by that change and kind of whether there's ways to control for that. So, so I just find it in general, a very interesting question and something to actively consider, even if you actively decide not to use some of these methods. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Henrik, and also uh, Maurits for the answer. Um, I would like to move on to Job. Um, unfortunately, I don't have your last name, Job, because you simply did not disclose it to us. But you um, put a question in the chat on the coexistence of certain uh, approaches like global versus local uh, in explainable AI. Could you please take the microphone and share your question or concerns with uh, the broader audience? Hey, good evening. Yes, this is uh, Job Visser. Last name not exposed, <laughs> GDPR reasons. <laughs> yeah, welcome, uh, no, I was uh, um, um, based on uh, yeah, ma mainly the conclusion of your presentation, Maurits. You seem to be making a case uh, for a mental model and against more or less uh, local and global explainability techniques. But don't you agree that they actually complement each other? So. Um, they're both just proxies, right? And there's pros and cons, but um, uh, global explainability and local techniques help you as a data scientist to better understand your data and model. So also help with the mental model, so to say. And for the subject matter expert or the, the patient or doctor, it can be for building trust. Yes, uh, no, I definitely agree with a lot of the things you're saying. Also, like my statement that we don't need these things was was a bit maybe aimed at sparking some of this discussion because obviously there are these links and in some ways you could argue that oh having a global and a local understanding through for example feature importance and kind of local permutations uh, is exactly what would build a useful mental model and I, I guess that's what you're you're arguing in a sense um, and I would I would 
go along with that argument um, you know, for, for quite a stretch uh, with one in some ways exception or, or something that I think is, is intriguing to consider for some of these methods is that potentially, for example, which I think is actually really true for, um, for feature importance is that it runs the risk of um, effectively kind of encouraging a wrong mental model for the problem that we're considering. So for example, if you're, if you're thinking about feature importance and the way this is often computed right now, or kind of the way it's often done, for example, in trees with something like variable importance, how like on how many branches of the tree does the variable actually occur, um, that itself would kind of spark the mental model that that variable is an important variable to potentially change. I, and this is a stretch already, yeah? But if it does actually get you, get somebody like either the doctor or a patient to that understanding, so to, to a mental model where, for example, changing my BMI is gonna you know, increase my life expectancy, um, I think we have to be very careful that, that if that model did not like explicitly consider the causality of BMI and maybe there was just some genetic reason that's causing both the BMI and the decreased life expectancy, that our method of exploration is prompting a mental model that is in some sense leading to the correct decisions. So the main thing I was trying to highlight is that some of the approaches we're now taking might not always, uh, so, so things are always more nuanced, but might not always lead to, the, to a mental model that's actually correct and correct in, with mental model, I mean, in the sense that people end up making the decisions that have the intended outcomes that they, they aim to pursue basically. So that is kind of where, where I think the discussion becomes interesting. Are these, are these methods really for everyone involved? Eh? So you're, you were talking about the data scientists who might be very well able to interpret these methods and like improve their models accordingly and know kind of the drawbacks. Um, but then if we cascade to the doctor and maybe even to the patient, I think we have to be very careful that those methods we're using or trying to use as an explanation actually are also then likely to, to end up forming a mental model for at the end of this cascade, the patient that's actually beneficial for them. And if it's likely that the methods we're using as data scientists in a sense, end up for patients creating mental models that are not useful for them, I think we should refrain from them. And this is kind of where I think this whole discussion is just interesting. Like, who are we trying to build these explanations for? And maybe we should be very thoughtful of what, what kind of methods we use at which step. So I, I don't think we're too far apart in that, that discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. You. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. There are a few more questions on this topic of the um, causality. Um, please allow me to postpone them. Um, because we are very close to uh, nine o'clock and we would like to close this meeting in time. But there is one interesting question, a final one uh, by, uh, by Peter or Peter Walgemoed. And for Esther, Peter, um, could you post your question to Esther, please? Yes, uh, I was, I'm very interested if you uh, think that AI will make a big impact on clinical decision making and how long it will take until it reaches clinical practice. And linked to that is the, I think, the curation of fair quality data to make that work. So I'm curious uh, about your opinion, how long it will take till it actually uh, is being used in clinical practice for treating patients. That's a difficult question to answer. Um, because, uh, well, you said for treating patients, I think it depends on what you want to use uh, the AI for. Um, I think we are, we are working on uh, looking how it can impact uh, diagnosing patients, so recognizing patients, uh, so risk prediction. I think uh, it, is, it has a great potential, but I also think it will take a long time before it will actually uh, reach clinical practice in uh, such a way that it is, uh, well, normal procedure. That will take a long time, I think. Uh, and I think it will be especially important for situations where patients are now uh, easily missed. So uh, rare diseases, unusual happenings, which on the other hand is immediately the most important, most difficult part uh, to, uh, to solve. So I think it takes a long time. 
And I think data quality is one of the things that we have to solve at first before we will ever get to, uh, to uh, prediction models that will really have a big impact. But this is slowly changing. There was someone else mentioning that 70 to 80% of the data is of bad quality, is unstructured. This is true, but it's slowly, it's changing. So uh, I think this is the first step that we have to take. But by showing the problems that we encounter, we can finally uh, get doctors to believe that, uh, that it's really important to change their way of registering their data. All right. Thank you. So is there something you would like to add? Well, I think uh, there are the two parts of this uh, AI uh, uh, challenge. And, and one uh, yeah, I'm also more involved in is on, on the imaging side uh, with yeah. pathology and radiology, where you see, of course, that uh, computer-aided detection was already there with mammography for a long time. Yeah. So uh, you see that I think there will be uh, um, major changes if, if the data and quality of that is, is connected. That's why this uh, question about the availability of the data to the patients becomes important. Because uh, if, if it indeed is possible to, uh, to do this diagnosis supported by AI, that will change, of course, the world. Because if we get, I could get access to the data uh, directly as a patient, and run it via an AI uh, algorithm and see what's on it, uh, just to support the decision making, and everybody starts doing that. Uh, I think uh, medicine will change, but I'm, I'm curious how do you, how do you see that, and how how will that uh, perhaps happen in the future? Well, maybe I, a I, short I, answer, uh, yeah. Esther. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is not really something that can be answered in a short way, but I'll try. Um, Imaging, uh, image and uh, d written data uh, is two different uh, fields. So for imaging, yes, I think that that will be quite a lot faster. Uh, but you also said you want to have patients to have a look at uh, algorithm results. Well, this is a field which I don't think most patients are ready for that yet. Maybe the, the audience we have here is, but the, the average patient is not yet. Uh, so I think that will take a long time before patients themselves will uh, put the algorithms to work. No, that, that is not what I meant. What, oh. I, what, you, what, I, what I see what's going on, if you, if you have an expert algorithm that knows mm -hmm. very much about a specific uh, cancer, for, for instance, mm -hmm. what you will see, I think, is that you can send it off to that servers because you have the data. And then the data comes back with a, with a result, basically. That's already happening in DNA analysis type of things with consumer to business type of services. So, yeah. uh, and of course, there are, will be radiology special clinics who also will say, uh, just come to us, send us our data, and, and we will give you an advice on what, uh, what, what you could have. So that, that I think, uh, is a movement we will see more, that it will be driven also more, at least especially in the US, not, not that much here, where it will be more consumer-driven, actually, yeah. patient-driven. I agree, but only for specific situations, for uh, very specific diseases or problems. But many patients come with more uh, vague uh, uh, situations that have to be solved, for, uh, well, analyzed first. And so... I think it will not be that fast, no. All right. Well, the liveliness of this debate shows that it is still uh, under development, and I'm afraid we are not going to solve that this evening. Um, but that uh, tells us that there is a, good, a lot of good work to do in the days and years to come. So let's, let's uh, stop the meeting, but not before we have expressed our thanks and gratitude to the two speakers, Esther and Maurits, thank you very much also for steering up uh, the lively debate. And that brings me to the audience, of course. Thanks to you, we could have this debate. So uh, it was really great to have you with us. And uh, that brings me to the end, but not before we can announce the next JETS expert talk, which will take place on the 1st of April and where we will discuss the issue of uh, data science and artificial intelligence for the social good. So thanks again, have a nice evening and see you back on the 1st of April. Bye-bye. <laughs>